Hello, Liverpool. How are you? You well? <laughs> Lovely. Give us a cheer if you're drinking tonight. <laughs> Lovely. I'm drinking as well. I'm not supposed to be drinking. My doctor has told me that I drink too much. He says, you have a drinking problem. To which I replied that vodka is a mixture of alcohol suspended in a solvent of water. So it turns out I also have a drinking solution. <laughs> He's open with a chemistry joke. He's a renegade. Yes. Yes, I am. Alcohol is the only drug I do. I don't do any other drugs. They try and do all the drugs one month in alphabetical order. I was way behind, but now I'm up to speed. <laughs> Those are my two tester jokes. And judging by that, we will be doing stories for the rest of the gig. Just so <laughs> I'll have no more of your puns, Paul Savage. It's fine. Uh, a lot of my stories are about me being a dickhead, because I'm a bit of a dickhead and it makes the stories easier to write. And a while back, a woman came up to me after a gig and she said, I liked what you did, I liked what you did, but you're very hard on yourself, you're very hard on yourself, you're very self-depreciating. Now the phrase is self-deprecating, right? Self-deprecating. Self-depreciating means that just by being me, <laughs> my value <laughs> over time, <laughs> and that is horribly accurate. <laughs> Go around the country, I do gigs all over the place. Uh, the other day, I had a guy in the front row. Uh, I was uh, chatting to his girlfriend, and he didn't like that. And so he started doing, after every joke I did, started being like, oh, ah, ha, ha, ha. Oh, well done. Oh, very good, right? And it was really weird, because he gave me everything I wanted from that gig. He gave me laughter, praise, and applause. But he did it all sarcastically. And I just wondered if everything I want from comedy could be given to me sarcastically. Just be like, oh, oh well done. Have a gig on Live at the Apollo. Well done. Have a massive tour. Yeah, well done. Win the Perrier. Oh, very good. Here's five stars to the Guardian. Well done, you. Here's a load of groupies. Oh, we do want to have sex with you. Oh, I did come. <laughs> could happen. So, um... I was chatting to a mate recently, and he's, um, he's quit his job. Uh, he was really high up at Google in uh, artificial intelligence. It was really interesting. I was like, why, why have you quit your job in artificial intelligence? And he said that the robots are going to start uprising, and he doesn't want to be any part of it. And I was like, A, you are not that good at your job, <laughs> that if you don't turn up, it's not going to happen, right? Unless you are the black guy from Terminator 2, it's not all down to you, right? <laughs> Uh, but also, B, I think if the robots do start uprising, we would fight back against them. Because we fight back against the machines all the time, even when they're being quite helpful. For instance, the little self-service machine in the supermarket, right? We fight back against that all the time. Because before, when it, uh, when it first came in, people were like, oh, you shouldn't use the self-service machine. It's going to take people's jobs. And it hasn't taken people's jobs. It's just moved them over there a bit. Because it used to be, you go to the bloke and he'd go, boop. And now you go to the machine and you're like, scan, S scan, 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 scan. And then the bloke comes over and just goes, come here, boop. <laughs> just move the job over there. And we cheat that little machine. That machine will ask us a question. It will say, How have you brought any bags from home? And you will say, yes, I have brought seven bags from home. And then you reach under the counter and you steal seven bags, right? <laughs> you put them on the scale and it takes it away. Or you can actually bring a bag from home uh, and you can take it away. Or you can put something that is the size, weight, and relative density of a 12-pack of Cronenberg 1664. You can put that on the scale, it'll take that away. And that is a little tip that I like to call theft. <laughs> Pretty good system, right? I've got another tip for, uh, for supermarkets as well. A lot of students in, you'll like this tip, right? Uh, well, it's got a little thing that I like to call misery shopping, right? Uh, what you need to do is you go to your large supermarkets. You need to go to uh, your Asda, your Morrisons, your Sainsbury's, one of the big ones, right? Uh, and you need to go when you are properly depressed, right? Uh, it doesn't work at Aldi and Lidl because they're already quite depressing, right? <laughs> Uh, you go to one of the big supermarkets, you go about 9 o'clock at night when they start putting yellow stickers on everything, right? And you walk around in a deep state of depression just going, oh, my God, I'm so sad. Oh, my God. Oh, I've made such poor choices in my life. Oh, my God. I'm so miserable. A steak for a pound. Yes, please. Oh, God, but I am just really miserable. A salad for 22 pence. Yeah, oh, God. But I do need to just start making better choices. Like a smoothie for 22p. Yeah. I have walked in there visibly depressed. I have walked out of there skipping, holding two rotisserie ducks and a birthday cake seven months before my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, 36 and a half. It's great, right? It's just, uh, dude, 
do like doing the, uh, the supermarket shopping. I uh, don't really like doing the internet shopping because uh, the algorithms can upset you a little bit. That's one of the things that we fight back with, the algorithms. Occasionally, you'll be on there and it'll just say, because you like this, we think that you'd like that. And how often do you go, we'll fucking see about that. <laughs> <I> just <laughs> Netflix has been like, because you watched House of Cards, we think you'd like Orange is the New Black. And you're just sitting there watching the first episode going, oh, this is quite good. <laughs> Fuck you, the machine, right? Just, uh, other thing I fight back against is the sat-nav in my car. I fight back against that all the time. It will say to you, you will arrive at your destination at 7.32. If I get there at 7.31, I am the champion of the universe. <laughs> it's like doing ridiculous speeds, 95 down country lanes, and the police stop you and just go, sir, why were you doing such a ridiculous, dangerous manoeuvre? Because I had to beat the machine. Well, why didn't you say so? Ah, oh, I've wasted two minutes of your time already. I'll put the blues and twos on. You slipstreaming, man. Go, go. <laughs> the weirdest ones with internet shopping is where they don't, where they don't know enough about you to have the proper algorithms to know what you'd like, right? Because I don't really use Amazon. Uh, last time I used Amazon was about four years ago, and then I started boycotting it for a reason I now can't remember, right? But I started boycotting Amazon, and the last thing I bought on Amazon was uh, a uh, washing line, because I needed a washing line, right? But Amazon <laughs> thinks that instead of that being a useful household item, uh, sort of essential for me, uh, it believes that was the first in my burgeoning collection of washing line <laughs> and washing line related material, just sort of like, I know what you like, ooh, people also bought pegs, ooh. <laughs> Amazon is very similar to your nan in it learnt something about you when you were quite small and now assumes that's true forever. Just sort of like, hello, love, hello. Uh, do you still like Panini's football stickers? And you're like, nan, I'm 36. <laughs> of course I do. Thank you very much. Uh, so Amazon, a bit like your nan. Netflix is a bit more like your mum because every so often it will just go, are you still watching this? <laughs> Leave the house. Go outside. Uh, so Amazon, like your nan, Netflix, a bit more like your mum, and Google is a bit like your Uncle Steve. Uh, not your real uncle, he's your dad's mate from the pub, because uh, he knows a lot of facts, not all of them are true, and he does know where to find porn. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Steve. Yeah, just don't tell your dad. Ooh. So Google's got a really weird thing, because they're starting to work on self-driving cars, and I don't want to get into a Google self-driving car, because I, I don't think I'd ever get into a taxi that knew everything that I'd ever typed into the internet whilst horny, right? If I went outside, I got an Uber now, and instead of saying my name, it just went, Asian babes. I was like, no, thank you, sir. I shall walk, right? It's weird, right? But the weird thing is uh, Google self-driving cars is that they are, um, they're having to teach them the, all the thing. That's why it used to be on Google, it would just be like, if you filled in a form, it would say, uh, can you just put, uh, just click this box, prove you're not a robot. And now it's like nine pictures and it says, pick all the ones that have got traffic lights in to prove you're not a robot. You have to click all of the ones, right? And it's going to be, the, the, the doing that, so it's scraping the internet to find, to teach the algorithm how the self-driving cars will work, right? And they are going to be weird in a few years because they're going to be out there in the real world. They're going to be making moral decisions on the things that we have taught them, right? Because now it just goes, click, prove you're not a robot, click this box. But well, soon it's going to be, there'll be like a car coming along, a self-driving car, and a child runs out in front of it. And it can either slam on the brakes but still hit the kid, injure it. It can swerve into oncoming traffic and cause a head-on collision. Or it can swerve the other way, go onto the pavement, kill an old man, right? And it's going to be, we're going to have to teach it. So it's just going to be like, prove you're not a robot. You'd kill the old man, wouldn't you? <laughs> You'd kill the old man, knock him off, knock off the old man. It's going to be weird. I don't think I'd trust Google uh, with a self-driving car because Google have got these other things that they do that I don't trust them with, right? Uh, Google have got a service called Google Translate, right? And uh, they are not always that accurate, right? I speak a little bit of Spanish and a while back, <laughs> I met a girl on Tinder, and we were chatting away, flirting away, and uh, I was flirting in Spanish and also using it to uh, use my vocabulary. You know, she, at one point, she was telling me a little bit of off office gossip. And so at one point, I went, decided to say, uh, oh, you're just a messy bitch who loves drama, which is a common phrase that we all use, right? <laughs> so, so I typed that into Google, because I wasn't sure about it. I was like, Google Translate, a messy bitch who loves drama, and it told me it was un pera sucia que ama drama. And I typed that, sent it across to her, and then I turned it round on Google Translate. And Google Translate told me it wasn't a messy bitch who loved drama. It was that she was a dirty whore who loves the theatre. <laughs> Incidentally, a dirty whore who loves the theatre is playing at the Everyman. It's 11 quid. Apparently, it's quite good. So, 
Uh, is way one because uh, the reason I wouldn't trust a Google self-driving car is because I had one of those Google speakers. You know, one of those things that, uh, like this Siri or the uh, the Alexa. Uh, basically, what you do is you go to the Google speaker and you say, "Hey Google, play," and then you say the name of a song, and then it plays literally anything else. Right? It's like, <laughs> "Hey Google, play the Beatles." It's like playing the Beastie Boys. You're like, "Ah, that's close enough. They're pretty good." So, <laughs> like, "Hey Google, play." S Club 7. It's like playing SS Club Anthems. You're like, no, I don't need Nazi beats, man. No, just ins, 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 kill the Jews. No, don't need that. Right? <laughs> I was in a hammock one day with my Google speaker, right? and I was a bit drunk, and I was yelling at the speaker. I wanted to play a song by Buster Rhymes. It's a song called Thank You. It's a really lovely song. It's got in the, an old gospel song uh, that goes, the sample that runs through it, and it goes, I want to thank you. Heavenly Father, for shining your light on me. Now, bearing in mind that is an old gospel song with a very Christian message. How many times do you reckon the N-word pops up in it? Because it's not none, the correct amount it should be, right? But I was in the hammock, and I was like, hey, Google, play Buster Rhymes. And it was like, playing Trevor Smith. And I was like, that is not even close. So I was like, hey, Google, play Buster Rhymes. Thank you. It was like, playing Trevor Smith. I was like, hey, Google, play Buster Rhymes. Thank you. And because the song was called Thank You, it made it all really passive aggressive, right? It's like, hey, Google, play Buster Rhymes. Thank you. It was like, playing Trevor Smith. And this went on for about five minutes. It was interrupting each other. And in the end, I let it play out. And it played the song I wanted. And I Googled the reason why. And it turns out that Buster Rhymes' real name is Trevor Smith. <laughs> and Google was just being delightfully formal about it, right? Which is so weird, because like, like, if you've never heard of Buster Rhymes, that is clearly a rapper, isn't it? That's a rapper's name. Whereas Trevor Smith is a lathe operator who plays, plays crown green bowls with your dad. That's, just, that's Trevor Smith, right? The um, weirdest thing was I was on Buster Rhymes' Wikipedia page and found out that when Buster Rhymes was about 16 years old, he grew up in the Bronx in New York, in a really rough area, and he got into a fight when he was about 16, an argument with some drug gangs, and he got, uh, his mum and dad got scared and sent to live with his auntie and uncle in England, and they sent him to live in Morecambe. Yeah, Buster Rhymes lived in Morecambe. <laughs> Buster Rhymes did uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air before Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? The three most famous people to come from Morecambe are Eric Morecambe, Thora Heard, and Buster Rhymes. <laughs> Why are you not more excited about this? This is the great... I texted everyone I knew when I found this out. <laughs> so last year I went out to, uh, I did, did some gigs in Australia. And it was really cool. Uh, while I was out in Australia, I uh, got into a relationship with a girl. And uh, we, uh, we realized that I only had about four weeks left on my visa. And we decided what we needed to do was to cram the entire relationship into one four-week period, right? And we did that quite successfully. Uh, to the point, our second date was a threesome. <laughs> and... Um, it was, um, it was one of the good threesomes, the proper one, the real one. I know it's 2020, we're not supposed to think one's better than the other one, but it was the good one, right? Uh, it was really weird. We went out the first night, we got really drunk. We went back to, we went back to mine, we had a lot of sex. Next night, we went out, got really drunk. There was a girl flirting with both of us, a mutual friend of ours, and we were like, fuck, is this happening? This is happening, right. So we got in an Uber, back to mine, we got into the bedroom, we're all getting naked. It's all very fun for about 15 minutes. And there was a point where I felt really left out of the threesome. <laughs> Where I was like, I don't really think I'm needed here at this point, right? Uh, and I was just like, I was out of my depth. And it was really weird because I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Which was very strange because I have seen, over the years, quite a few instructional videos. <laughs> but the instructional videos can lie to you, can't they? Instructional videos. Um, I'm not sure that yoga teachers are supposed to do that. And plumbers don't always turn up on time. Right? So, <laughs> so I'm like, I must get, must get more involved in the threesome. At one point, I was just stroking one of their backs. <laughs> Is this, is this helping? Is this doing anything at all? So, well, I, must, I must get more involved. So they were in the 69 position, the two girls. I got onto the bed, and then I got on top of them. And my girlfriend described it as my face appearing like the weirdest sunrise <laughs> on an alien planet as between another girl's buttocks. My face just... And we looked at each other dead in the eyes. Right? We'd only known each other for a couple of days at this point. But she looked me dead in the eyes and she mouthed at me, I really, really like you. And it was a really beautiful moment because I mouthed back immediately, I really, really like you too. And it was a wonderful, beautiful, intimate moment. But one that probably shouldn't have happened while I was licking another woman's bits. Right? <laughs> Just, well, I, I love this woman. I think she's great. In fact, I want to marry her and have kids purely so that can be our story. You know the one I mean? You know when you meet a new couple of like, oh, how do you crazy kids get together? And you're like, oh, you'll never guess. <laughs> you will literally never guess. Right? I want to do it to like 30, 40 years into the future. I'm uh, like retired. I've got my cottage out in the countryside. I've got my little rocking chair. I've got my log fire. And all the grandkids come around and they're like, 
Grandma Paul, Grandma Paul, tell us one of your stories. Tell us how you knew Grandma was the one. Well, I was rimming out an American burlesque dancer. I think it would be a lovely moment, right? Just, uh, I was doing this story a while back in a show, and uh, it was up at the Fringe, and uh, one day a group of uh, deaf people came to see it. It was a deaf theatre company, and they said, oh, well, can, we, uh, can we come to the show? We'll get the one who hears best to translate for everyone else. I was like, yeah, that'd be brilliant, right? And this story was about 20 minutes in, right? And it turns out that not every word in the English language has a British Sign Language equivalent, right? So what they'll do is they will just sort of improvise it to get the gist across, right? So this, for instance, in, in British Sign Language is sex, right? So when it got to the point where I said threesome, she went, ooh, uh, uh, three, sex, and like that. We had, and they were all just sitting there, just going, what? <laughs> and then they all did what they imagined the sign for threesome should be. One bloke just went, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> You've been really fun, that has been my time. I've been Paul Savage. Good night, God bless. I'll see you again.